You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Once again, folks, on the other end of the line, the telephone line, I have Gary Hunt, the CAGI representative who was in Waco, Texas for most of the period of time that Branch Davidian was under siege. Welcome back, Gary. Oh, how are you today? Uh, I'm fine. Uh, can you fill us in on uh, what happened after the last time that we talked? Well, as we all know, the uh, April 19, 1993, the FBI, uh, through their actions, uh, either negligently or intentionally, murdered 86 people in the Mount Carmel complex. Uh, that's correct. What circumstances led up to that? The FBI was unwilling, absolutely unwilling, to uh, tolerate any uh, outside assistance in, a, in finding a peaceful resolution in Waco. There were many efforts. The only one that they succumbed to was the one that which involved uh, Dick DeGrun going into the complex. Uh, Dick DeGrun was, uh, had gone to Baylor University in Waco with William Sessions, and they had been friends in school, and I'm sure that's how he managed to get in. I'm not going to say that it's unfortunate that he got in because he is able to bring out a lot of truth of what did occur in the complex. Uh, he did see a lot of the evidence and he's been uh, giving that information out and I respect him very much for a bar attorney to take the risk that he has by exposing that. But there were family members, uh, there were myself with the power of attorney, there were many people trying uh, various efforts to attempt to achieve a peaceful resolution. And in hindsight, looking back, it seems that every effort for peaceful resolution was overturned or just uh, ignored by the FBI and the ATF. That well, they did not seek a peaceful resolution. Well, you don't really believe that they wanted to, do you? No, I don't. Uh, I was surprised, however, when the building caught fire until I realized that that would be the only way that they could destroy all the evidence. Just prior to, uh, just prior to the building catching fire, the front door to the complex, which we in Waco knew, held a very significant hard evidence as to who fired first, uh, was run over at least three times by a tank. Now, it's kind of interesting that we were told at the 10.30 press conference that morning before the fire that the tank retriever was the vehicle that was equipped for the M5 disbursement of CS gas. In Congress now, they're calling it tear gas, which generally refers to pepper gas, but the CS gas is much more debilitating. And from both rights, I understand that the tear gas is carried on a medium called CAP, which is a flammable liquid, uh, similar to kerosene. So it's our, it's our experience that uh, we're not going to... Um we're not going to give any credence to what that man says on this show because we know who he is and what he's doing. We know he's a 32nd degree Freemason. He's also a member of the Mormon Church. And uh, the man is a Trojan horse. Also, CS gas, uh, Colonel Grice has made a statement that CS gas is an inhumane, uh, 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 life threatening gas, and that is not true. It is not. Uh, every military recruit who goes through boot camp goes through uh, tear gas training in the CS gas that's used. And uh, it is not uh, inhumane or seriously debilitating. In fact, uh, the fresh breeze blowing uh, on the face and into the, into the lungs uh, can quickly uh, allow a person to recover. So uh, the dispersion system was a medium that used the liquid spray. We do know that from the press conference. I would assume that it would be a petroleum base so that it would adhere to the walls and then allow the CS gas to dissipate slowly. The question arises, though, that if we want to uh, inject CS gas in that building, do we want our intrusion holes to be as small as possible to provide containment and concentration of the gas, or do we want to take out wall sections? I would think that logically we would not want to take out wall sections. However, in reviewing the videos, it seemed that there was a very clear effort to remove wall sections to knock them down. Well, they, they started off that morning with lies. I mean, at the press conference, they told us that uh, that they were going to begin to knock the compound down uh, room by room and section by section and uh, slowly cause the Branch Davidian members to move into one small section of the church where they could be more easily contained and where it would be uh, more difficult for them to hold out with so many people uh, in one room. 
uh, that was the first thing that they told us. Later they told us that the tank was knocking holes in the walls uh, in order to inject uh, CS gas, and we know that it wasn't a gas, the size of the hoses of the, on the tanks would not allow uh, pumping and dispersion of a gas uh, such as CS, but would be perfect for the pumping of some type of a liquid. So your statement that it would be a petroleum-based liquid uh, containing CS gas, uh, which would allow it to release slowly and stick to the walls and floors, is probably closer to the truth. We sent people downwind from the church to see if they could smell CS gas, and we sent veterans who knew what CS gas smelled like, and they could not smell anything except petroleum on the wind. I think they could not either. They did block off the uh, old Mahia Road area, which is closest uh, upwind to the point. Uh, they extended the blockade that, uh, that Monday morning. And we believe the reason that the press has not still even been allowed uh, up, up to the... Uh, the location where the uh, church was burned is because uh, they haven't yet destroyed the evidence of, of the flammable material that was uh, put into the church. We know that the, uh, the bright crimson red flames and the intense dark black billowing smoke is the, is the classic signature of a petroleum fire. We know that our agents who went downwind to try to detect tear gas on the wind, which was blowing about 30 knots that day, uh, could only smell the smell of petroleum. They could smell no tear gas whatsoever. We also know that they knocked so many holes in that building that even if they had been injecting tear gas, it would have blown right through. <laughs> and it wouldn't have hurt anybody. But it did provide the adequate circulation for a fire to erupt and, and destroy the building. Now, the building was uh, nearly 10 acres on the ground, uh, between 6 and 10 acres. I don't know the exact footage, but it went to the ground in 32 minutes. Uh, yes. In fact, the holes that they punched in the walls uh, guaranteed that with a 30-knot wind, the, the fire would uh, spread and consume everything that was uh, flammable uh, within a short period of time, and that's exactly what it did. And looking at the known intrusions into the building where they knocked the panels out, those are in alignment with it. Uh, they're primarily on the face of the building that faced the wind. The, south, uh, the west side of the building, the wind was coming from the, uh, uh, the southwest uh, uh, west southwest, I'm sorry. And uh, so the south end and the west end of the building were those that we know were perforated quite well. And we also have a video that was a live feed at the time that uh, shortly after the tank went in and, and ground the front door and it uh, supported evidence into the ground, another tank entered the tower to the right of the front door, the lower tower. Uh, it was apparently inside. Uh, we see smoke beginning to come out of the second floor window immediately over where the tank was. As the tank begins to back out, flame bursts from the window directly over the tank. Now we're told by the FBI that their sniper through a scope saw this guy making a circular motion and cupping his hands and then flames erupted. Now I'm sure you've been around the tank, those that have know the tremendous vibration and noise that comes from that tank. So we're led to believe now that this uh, very brave person uh, went onto the second floor of that tower portion on the corner where the supporting walls on both sides had been damaged and amidst this noise and trembling and this fear of collapse uh, was calm enough to spread some material down and then they light a match and light the, uh, the material on fire. That's what we're being told to believe by the FBI. Well, we have trouble with that story. Well, uh, we have trouble with all of their stories so far. Everything that we've investigated that they've said has either turned out to be a lie or they themselves have proved to be a lie, uh, a lie by reversing their story uh, sometime after they gave the original story to something entirely 100% different, those proving themselves liars. We know from the interview that I did with Rita Riddle long before the church was, uh, was burned, um, she came out on March the 21st, and I did a one-hour interview with her that was broadcast on this show, The Hour of the Time. And she stated that the tanks had destroyed their kerosene supply by running over their, their fuel barrels in the back of the church where uh, they had stored their fuel, and that they had actually very little kerosene inside the church for the lamps. We also know they didn't need any lamps inside the church because of the tremendously brilliant floodlights and the spotlights that the uh, 
that the federal forces were were maintaining uh, throughout the night as a psychological warfare operation, actually, uh, along with the loudspeakers uh, uh, blaring all kinds of disturbing and ridiculous uh, sounds and music. So we speaking with Rita since the fire. Uh, she was that morning uh, on uh, April 19th at 9 o'clock, approximately 9 o'clock in the morning, was taken down to the courthouse and charged with conspiracy to murder, murder federal agents. Uh, that was shortly after she spoke uh, with you, Bill, and uh, after many conversations with me, and that was a risk that she recognized she might be facing by speaking with us. But she did say that she had spoken to people that had come out of the fire when I spoke to her that afternoon and that there were lanterns being used in the daytime and they were left burning because there was a, a need for light in, inside the hallways. There were certain areas of the building that were lit all the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, then we have, uh, you know, we, as I say, we have uh, evidence that there was a tank inside where the fire on the southwest of the building began. Also, I've looked at the films and I'm waiting for copies uh, to arrive from uh, Waco now. Uh, the fire on the second floor, if you, if you think back to what you saw occur then, normally a fire going from room to room would build up within a room and then would crash into the that's correct, but that's not what happened. It went through the whole building almost instantaneously. A very smooth roll across the second floor, and that wolf, the floor is compartmentalized. Each window is to one room, all those windows. And as if it was, if there were no walls inside the way the fire swept through that second, second floor. But there were walls. There were walls. There were walls. Yes. There was between each of the windows. Each was a room. There was a hallway behind them. Mm -hmm. So that fire should have burst from room to room instead of that smooth flow. That smooth flow would only be indicative of... Well, you're, you're talking about... We're getting into a lot of conjecture here. We're talking about the second floor, Gary. The fire had already spread throughout the whole church on the first floor. It's possible that the fire went up through the, the, the uh, ceiling between the first floor and the second floor. So you know, let's uh, sort of stick to things that... Um, that we don't have to do so much conjecture that we can more or less back up with facts and and uh, because I'll tell you what anytime we go into a lot of conjecture we're going to be attacked uh, by by the enemy who, who wants the, the American people to believe that uh, um, that what they're told by the FBI and the BATF is true we know that um, that they have as the head of the investigating team for the fire a man who was actually a member of the BATF for many years. Did, were you aware of that? Well, I know that his wife is currently a secretary for the ATF in, in Houston office. That's correct. And he uh, was a member of the BATF for many years. The question I have about that is why is uh, the FBI and or ATF doing an investigation of the fire when that's been specifically delegated to the Texas Rangers? The only evidence being turned over to the F, uh, FBI and ATF is that evidence that uh, is the object of the original search, uh, two search warrants and the arrest warrant. Well, they're doing they're doing an investigation, Gary, for the same reason that I would try to get away with investigating myself if I were accused of murder. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, okay, that's the only conclusion I can come to, too. Uh, we've all well, got the Congress. Well, well sure. They, if, if you're investigating something that happened, the people who were involved in what happened cannot conduct the investigation. I mean, that's, uh, that's not only common sense, but it's a matter of uh, ethics and moral principle and law for since the beginning of this country. You just don't do that. And the, the fact that they're doing it and getting away with it uh, just is another example to me that they're not dealing with the law, that the Constitution is already dead and buried, and the American people are the biggest bunch of stupid sheeple that have ever lived. They're not questioning anything about this. They're buying the propaganda. They've swallowed the hook, the line, the sinker, and now they're chewing on the pole. Well, if you think back, Bill, too, it's rather unfortunate that very possibly the fact that the investigation was going to be handled by the Texas Rangers uh, forced even further the hand of the FBI and ATF to, uh, to burn the building and destroy the evidence and murder the people inside. Well, uh, I think that that was what they set out to do to begin with, and I don't think that that had anything to do with who was going to ultimately investigate it. I believe that that was the whole intention of everything that they've done 
uh, from day one. Were you aware that Delta members of Delta Force and British SAS were on scene? I didn't know about SAS. I knew Delta Force, uh, Steel Team 7 and the FBI hostage rescue, rescue team were all present. Our source is the London Times, March the 21st uh, of this year, where they state in the Sunday Times in a large article about uh, the, the Waco massacre uh, that British SAS and Delta forces were on scene literally from the beginning. And uh, Janet Reno has verified that Delta forces were there uh, and were her advising her, and she was taking their advice, um, and she said that in front of the Congressional Investigating Committee. Uh, that's it's amazing that these anti-terrorist and hostage rescue uh, teams were, were so misdirected by the FBI that they refused to acknowledge that the FBI was actually holding the hostages and the people that needed rescue were inside of the building and they did not exert their authority uh, properly, nor did they go after the terrorists, the ATF, uh, who instigated this whole thing in the beginning. Yeah, they wouldn't. They all have the same goal, and they're all uh, moving us into a state of fear so that no one will oppose the ultimate uh, destruction of our Constitution and Bill of Rights overtly. It's already been done covertly, and our merger with, uh, with uh, other countries of the world under a one-world government. These people are all trained and uh, moving us in that direction. We know that uh, all of these agencies are made up of people who belong to secret societies and certain religious groups, one of which is one of the largest and wealthiest in this country, the Mormon Church, and uh, the largest uh, secret society is the uh, Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Uh, we know this through our investigations. We know that these people are, are uh, uh, being controlled by these organizations. We know that the BATF is an unconstitutional organization created with the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. And uh, when prohibition was done away with, they were transferred to the Treasury Department or the Department of Treasury and not the United States Treasury. The Department of Treasury or the Treasury Department is actually a private corporation uh, which comes under the Federal Reserve. If you want to get right down to it, the people who are pulling off these raids and controlling this country uh, are not a part of the United States, are not sworn uh, allegiance to the United States. And Janet Reno is the head of Interpol, which is in, uh, in this country, which is an international organization. And to be the head of Interpol, she has to agree to forego any allegiance to the United States in her operations as, as the head of Interpol here. So we're not talking about Americans. These people are not Americans. They don't give a damn about this country or the Constitution, uh, the, the belief of the, the large number of, of sheeple notwithstanding. Uh, let's go one further. While I was in Waco, I received in the mail a copy of a public law that was uh, passed, uh, an amendment to the Bretton Woods Agreement. And in that, it made it clear that the U.S. Secretary of the Treasurer uh, Treasury uh, could not be paid by the United States. He could not receive two cap salaries, and he would receive his salary from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. So that's correct. Also, uh, working for uh, foreign powers. That's correct. Now, Bill, you know while I was down there, many people uh, had called me and asked if they should bring their rifles to Waco. Uh, there were also some efforts via the fact network to bring an armed militia to Waco, and in every case I stood against that. I explained to people that it, we're not ready for an armed militia until we're ready to accuse the government of sedition. And when that accusation came, that it would be the beginning of something that wouldn't be over until it was over. Uh, I think you can construct what I mean out of that. Well, the purpose of this radio show, and let me make that very clear to you and to everybody listening, is to wake up the American people so that we can stop what's coming without any bloodshed. Bloodshed is, can, can be averted altogether if enough people wake up to exert the power of the people and put all these traitors in jail, and that's what they are, literally, as traitors. Well, I agree with you, but I think at this time, and since April 19th, we must understand one thing, and as, as you have pointed out. Well, let me first back up. Sedition is joining an organization with the purpose of overthrowing the lawful government. Now, I accuse the government of the United States of sedition 
for joining the United Nations and as a member of that organization attempting to overthrow the lawful government of this country. Well, let, let's, let's clarify that. It's not the government that's guilty. It's individuals within the government who have conspired with others in secret societies and secret organizations to bring this about. Our constitutional government is not guilty. Uh, <laughs> you're probably right, but the government as it sits today, uh, any member of that government who is not uh, guilty of sedition needs to, to come forward and, and tell us what he knows. They need to, well, they need to stand up and, and uh, determine which side that they're on and declare it publicly is what they need to do. I foresee a lot of bloodshed coming in this country if people don't wake up and, and do what needs to be done legally, exerting the power of the people, and that's the purpose of this program, is to, is to forego any bloodshed, to stop any bloodshed, to make sure that there's not a revolution in this country. Um, and, and do it the right way. Now, if it's not done the right way, we all know what's going to happen and doesn't even need to be uh, talked about. Everybody who understands the Constitution and who's a real patriot knows what's coming and they know what their duty is going to have to be. Well, we know what a re revolution is. That's a revolt against the government of authority. But there's an old practice in this country that went on for many, many years. Uh, <coughs> that practice was one where people would come to the aid of their neighbor. It was practiced in volunteer fire departments where people would risk, risk life and limb to save property and, and lives. Uh, we had an old concept of posses where the sheriff would call together a posse to go after those bad elements of society and, and in lawful pursuit would arrest them. Uh, at that time they were risking their lives as well uh, to bring justice. Over the years uh, the administrative agencies have uh, taken that spirit of helpfulness away from us and denied us that gift of helping our neighbors. Well, I don't believe that, Gary. I believe that people have just stopped doing what they know is right. I'm not going to give the sheeple any way out. They're guilty. They're sheeple. They're stupid. Americans are bringing this upon themselves by abdicating their responsibility, by their stupidity, by their ignorance, by their apathy. And I'm not going to let them get away with uh, with uh, getting out from under by rationalization or anything else. Also, I have to clear something else. What's coming is not a revolution. It will not be a revolution if it happens. It will be an attempt, and a lawful and legal attempt, to restore the Constitution as the supreme law of this land. I agree with, but I think that our, our challenge is going to be coming in the next few weeks. Uh, there are people in Montana that have indicated to me that they are under the understanding that the Church Universal and Triumphant, which owns about 12,000 acres in the Grand Teton Ranch, uh, just outside of Livingston, Montana, are anticipating that ground force of 2,000 men with aerial support will be attacking their church in the same manner Waco was. I hope that this is a rumor. Uh, if this is not, though, I think that we need to understand that the concept of our liberties comes from neighbor helping neighbor. Uh, if there were a fire, we would go to their aid. If there were a bad guy in their house, we would go in to take the bad guy out. If they were being attacked by unlawful authorities, we would help them resist that. Now, I've, I've got to interrupt you right now, Gary. We've uh, discussed the possibility of an attack upon the church universal and triumphant on this show. We've got to take a break right now, and uh, when we come back, we'll talk more about this. Uh, but right now, we've got to uh, take care of business and do our uh, sponsor thing. And uh, uh, we'll be right back, folks. Don't go away. Uh, stay in your seats. We'll be right back after this very short pause. That didn't take long. We're back. Gary, uh, you were talking about a church in Montana. Would you care to... Uh, uh, talk about the identity of that church and just exactly why you think that church may be targeted? Well, the church is called Church Universal and Triumphant. Its leader, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, uh, has, uh, has spoken in a number of places. I think she's got a few books out. Uh, they are a church, uh, in a sense, similar to uh, the Branch Davidian Church and uh, to Randy Weaver, even, in that they believe in Yahweh and they celebrate uh, the Sabbath on Saturday. That seems to be a common denominator in the targets that have been selected uh, recently for intervention by the government. Uh, 
Uh, apparently a couple members of the church were recently charged with firearms violations. Uh, I think they were convicted. They were minor violations. I'm not sure if there was just a penalty associated with their convictions. I think that was the case, but I have not uh, had the opportunity to investigate that thoroughly. But there is a uh, rumor, as I said, spreading up in the Montana area, and uh, even Prodigy uh, Computer Services has carried stories that they are probably next. It looks like the same setup job, the uh, local television and radio stations and newspapers uh, doing smear jobs has already begun to occur on them as they did uh, the preceded the attack on the Mount Carmel Church Complex in Waco. Without a doubt, the propaganda machine is turning and they've, they're aimed uh, their weapons directly at the Church Universal and Triumphant and uh, uh, last uh, Friday night, we did a show on the Hour of the Time um, talking about that and read one of the articles that, uh, that has been printed about them. But, uh, you know, according to the similarities between Church Universal and Triumphant and Branch Davidian, um, that also fits the entire uh, uh, Jewish religion. It also fits the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and a whole bunch of other churches. Uh, why would they uh, single out the Church Universal and Triumphant and not uh, begin attacking Jewish synagogues or, uh, or uh, Seventh-day Adventists? Well, I, I think that we can uh, look at a logical assumption that if we've got a freestanding church, uh, a sect, uh, per se, that has separated from a mainstream church, as was the case with the Branch Davidians, or an individual such as Randy Weaver that didn't affiliate with any church, or a church that uh, has just uh, come of its own and lives out in the country and is otherwise isolated uh, itself from the mainstream population that we uh, have ideal uh, targets to protect our trade of uh, destroying churches. And uh, In other words, they're not mainstream. They don't have an army of followers. Uh, it's, it's a small organization, and they may have uh, three or 4,000 members, but they're not all there and uh, probably would not uh, rise up with arms. Uh, basically, the pattern that I've found throughout this whole thing is any small religious group with guns, particularly Christians. Is, is that your, your finding? Yes, it is. They, they do have to have guns. That's a requisite for ACF to justify. They don't have to be a legal firearm. Well, according to the ATF in their first press conference, I mean, they raided Branch Davidian because uh, they heard from a foreign source that they were going to commit suicide. Well, that's, uh, I think it used to be a capital crime to attack suicide. <laughs> I think we might have that back again. Well, don't you think it's kind of strange and, and a little bit ironic that the method of stopping them from committing suicide was to kill them all? Mark Grohl is a fellow, and I don't know if we'd have mentioned him, but has been critical of the Branch Davidian Church. For we found Mark, Mark Bro directly connected to the Cult Awareness Network, which is directly connected to the ADL, which is a branch off B'nai B'rith, which was created and is controlled by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Everything always gets back to, to the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in this country. And, and, you know, the, the reprogrammers, now they accuse Korsh of programming people, but to me, programming has a connotation of captive audience. And those people walked voluntarily into the uh, David Korsh's church and voluntarily sat down and listened to David. In fact, Rita probably pointed this out, that David had a way of putting the scriptures together unlike anyone else. That's, that's exactly what she said. But all of this is moot because in this country, an adult has the right to believe and listen to whoever they want to. Uh, to worship at whatever the altar they want to. And uh, let's look at CAM, though. They go out and kidnap people and then put them in a motel room and they're a captive audience for two to three weeks going through an intense... That's right. They are, they are actual kidnappers. And brainwashers is, is actually what they are, and they should all be in jail. Um, but the, well, the point I'm trying to make is... Uh, is in this country, it doesn't matter uh, why an adult follows someone else. They have a right to do it, and no one has a right to stop them 
even if they're breaking the law. You have the right to arrest them and charge them with the breaking of that law. And if they're convicted, uh, of course, they have to serve whatever punishment goes along with that. But it does not include telling them that they cannot uh, go to this church or that church or follow this person because he is or is not charismatic or whatever whatever the, the, the criteria is. Uh, these are basic, basic losses of basic freedoms in this country. It's nobody's business why those people were there listening to David Koresh. It's only their business if they broke a law. And as far as we could tell, nobody broke any laws. Paul had a federal firearms dealer's license and was buying and selling guns. Some of the guns he sold to some of the male members of the church, including David Koresh, who under the second article of amendment all had the right to buy guns if they wanted to. There was no tremendous cache of weapons. There were no 50 caliber machine guns. There were no hand grenades. There were no rockets. If there had have been, guess who would have won the war? With a 50 caliber machine gun, I alone by myself could have destroyed all of those federal troops that were there. And all the Bradleys, unfortunately, if they got the Abrams in, you might have a little bit of a problem. Well, you know, so by the time they got those there, uh, after I'd won the war, I would have been long gone. Also, the press conference was well within range of both rockets and 50 caliber machine guns. Not, in, not within effective range of a 50 caliber machine gun, but nevertheless in range. And when I fought in Vietnam, I saw machine gunners who could have hit that uh, that press briefing area and uh, the entire area where, where the BATF and the FBI were stationed, uh, could have just wiped them all out. The truth is there was no evidence, no nothing pointing to any of the accusations against these people being true. The local sheriff said that he had personally checked all of their weapons and returned them to the church, and they had found nothing illegal about any of them. It was back in 1987. Uh, yes, and all of these allegations about huge stockpiles of weapons isn't true. Uh, the only people that we can uh, uh, determine had any weapons were some of these uh, 30-some-odd men who were in there. The rest were all women and children. So my understanding is probably less than 10 people picked up firearms to defend the church or would have normally. That's correct. Maybe more have uh, the people I've spoken uh, to don't know for sure, but there were less than 10 they were proficient or would be considered proficient with the firearms. Right. So we've got 10 people or less than 10 percent. Uh, and I would say that that's probably less than the average population uh, as far as proficiency in firearms. They had a relatively low ratio of people proficient in firearms. Gary, what about, uh, what, what about the, the way that these people were tried and convicted and executed uh, by the public, actually, basically? I mean, that's what it boils down to. The public believed all the lies. They were they were tried. They were given the evidence of propaganda, and the evidence basically was a bunch of accusations uh, that are not true, including accusations of sexual misconduct, abuse of children. Uh, the president of the United States stood up in a press conference and said that uh, David Koresh was having sex with children. We know that that was a lie. Uh, the American people bought this and allowed them to be executed without due process of law, without allowing them to face their accusers. Um, I understand seven are uh, facing charges of conspiracy to murder federal, federal agents now. The charges against Rita Riddle were subsequently dropped. But just in case, let's take Congress and spend tens of millions of dollars to have another trial so everybody in this country knows they're guilty before they're selected for jury. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure that we get some convictions because we've got to justify the in excess of $100 million that's been spent on this fiasco. So far, we've got to justify the 93 deaths or 92 deaths, uh, the murders that occurred. Oh, we've also got to justify the loss of four BATF forces who uh, uh, were killed in the line of duty assaulting that building. So, you know, Congress is, is the epitome of a snow job. They're conditioning all America to accept the allegations of guilt without a trial. Well, we, we already know that the, uh, that the the verdict was in before the congressional investigation ever started. We have a tape recording of uh, Deacon Sini of Arizona stating that uh, Koresh and the people were guilty, that he was crazy, that they were lunatics, and that they deserved to die. 
Uh, we also now have a uh, tape of uh, Brooks, who's the uh, committee chairman of the investigating committee, stating uh, when he thought that the microphones were turned off and that the cameras were not on him, he's talking to the head of the BATF, and he states very clearly on the tape that if it had been him, he would have burned them out in the beginning. <laughs> Those escaped, I think it was on the yeah, yeah. Uh, so we know that the whole thing is rigged from from the beginning. And by the way, folks, we will be airing uh, the audio portion of that tape so that you can all hear the committee chairman uh, Brooks make those statements. And you've already heard Deacon Cini on this show. Uh, so uh, this is just uh, it's just a show for the sheeple. That's all it is. It's a song and dance. It's Barnum and Bailey. It's 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 there's a sucker born every minute in uh, uh, a nation or a world of people who will not use their intelligence or no better than animals who do not have intelligence. And such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. Quote unquote. And for those of you who don't have a copy of my book, that's in chapter one. We have a uh, quote by Janet Reno, and I, I don't have the exact wording. I've read it, but uh, she says something to the effect that uh, this just proves that we need to go after these cults that uh, have too many weapons stockpiled. Now, back again, is that a setup? Is that the precursor to the attack on the? Well, the, the Randy Weaver, the Randy Weaver episode, we believe, and in fact, we have substantial evidence that that was a shock test to see how much the American people would allow. Bo Greitz went across this country uh, and began before July of 1990. Um, in fact, he was talking about this on the Billy Goodman happening, which went off the air about the last part of 1989. And he was talking about the fact that he'd received a letter from a guy named Randy Weaver that served with him in Vietnam and that he was afraid that the federal forces were going to come and kill him and his whole family. So Weaver thing was being set up in the Patriot Movement by Greitz as early as late 1989. And, uh, and uh, we believe that that was a test to see if the Patriots would allow them to actually do what they did. Now, the, uh, the uh, Waco massacre is just the confirmation of what they learned at the Randy Weaver cabin. Well, we're, we're going to have the next time uh, we're stepping up. We're going to go to 2,000 people and 12,000 acres now. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to continue. If they, can, if they can win and win quickly, maybe they can justify their actions by the, the theft or, I'm sorry, forfeiture of that property. Or maybe they'll get their butts kicked. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me tell you something. For 86 people to stay in a burning building and choose death rather than come out and and and, and give up and, and throw away their principles and their religion, to me, tells me that they're up against some hellacious odds. A thought has occurred to me frequently since April 19th, and that is of April 19th, 1775. And, and all of the first 100 Americans, the first 100 Americans, stood against 400 British. They weren't defending their own property, their own homes, their own lives. They were buying time for people in Concord to remove the stockpiled weapons so that the American colonists could uh, fend off the, the impending attack by the British. That's correct. 100 men, what went through their minds at the, the point that they stood face to face with 400 uh, of the British Empire, fourth is the best of the British Empire. They didn't break and run. They stood firm. Well, that's another thing that's ironic about the Waco Massacre. Patriots like you and me and, and many others realize what that date meant. But most Americans have no idea that that is what started the Revolutionary War and created this country. Now, here's another thought. A lot of people have asked me this about the people in the complex. Why didn't they come out? Why didn't they surrender? Uh, let's put ourselves in their uh, situation. They know that they were attacked uh, by the BATF, but that is something to be heard in court. Now we heard Rick say on a number of occasions, why don't uh, occasions why don't they just come out and submit themselves to the bar of justice? If they did, here's what would happen. They knew already that the children would be taken and put in foster homes. They possibly, uh, over a period of time, even adopted out. They knew that they would be put in jail and held in jail until they went to trial. With the complexity of issues and the number of the people involved, 
that that trial would have been 12 to 18 months to the first trial beginning and possibly two to three years uh, from the beginning until the trials were all completed. At the same time, all the property, they were told as they came out, your property is forfeit, we own it. So here's some people that would have lost everything they gained in life had they walked out with their hands up as was the only acceptable solution to the FBI. When talking to Rita Riddle, I think they knew more about the ideological principles involved with this than, uh, than anybody uh, is really aware of. I believe that uh, it was not only the fear of losing everything that caused them to stay inside, but I believe that they really, in their heart, knew that they were making a stand for something that's more important than any, any property or the fact that they might lose their children. Uh, they were making a stand for the future of freedom in this country and for uh, the right to worship the religion of their choice. And most of them, uh, it, you see the warrants were only for uh, David Koresh and this other guy named Paul, according to the information that we have. Now, if that's true, then nobody in the church, else in the church was wanted or did anything wrong or had any legal charges uh, on them at all, and all of this talk about David Koresh holding them hostage is, is uh, total uh, crap. It's, it's total nonsense. It, he could not have held all of those people hostage, uh, even if he had wanted to. Even if he was a superman and could have stayed awake every night, even if he had three or four other people to help him, there's no way he could have kept all those people in that church. Well, that, my point was that, that these people would be submitting to slavery uh, and they stood in that church to the bitter end, the, the fiery end, the same as those hundred men stood at Lexington Green. And burning people behind their actions uh, was what caused them to be willing to give their lives uh, for that cause, a cause of freedom and liberty that uh, we uh, we profess so much that very few, the only hundred Americans that exist in this country right now, uh, were burned to death on April 19th or in jail in McLennan County. The rest of us want to be Americans and should stand up and be Americans, but I think that we've been outshone by the people who stood for our freedom and our liberty on April 19th. Well, I think you're absolutely, uh, absolutely correct. Uh, but I think everybody's uh, chance to make a decision is quickly coming, and as I've said on this show many, many times, every person in this country is going to have to make a personal decision, and they're going to have to do it uh, very quickly. Uh, they're either going to have to stand up and stop this, help us stop this, or they're going to reach down and voluntarily enslave themselves and put the chains around their own ankles. Well, I think the point the decision needed to be made was April 19th, and now is putting it into action. Well, I don't think it could have been made on April the 19th. I think it can be made now because I think a lot of people are finally beginning to get the message, and if they're listening to this show, they're learning a lot of other things besides what happened on April the 19th are coming down. Uh, the, the new legislation that's in front of Congress that will effectively outlaw any political protest whatsoever, outlaw any kind of meetings in anybody's home or place of business, outline any picketing or striking or anything. And I'm talking about F8 uh, and the other bills. Property forfeiture laws, uh, if you use your house to meet or your car to transport yourself to those activities. Absolutely. And if anybody even gets in a fist fight that was there at your house, whether you, whether you knew about it or not, or in fact, if anybody even has any, any uh, reason to believe that the purpose of the meeting is uh, might result in a violent act, everybody at that meeting could be charged with terrorism and all of their property can be forfeited. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people out there saying, well, if that's what they're doing, then that's what should happen to them. But uh, uh, they better stop and think about this, because this can be used against anybody, whether, they're, whether they have any intentions toward violence or not. It's an effective way to stop any political opposition to what's coming right now. Well, Bill, I will be back in Waco in the near future, and I will uh, be speaking to the people that came out of the fire. Uh, I will make a point to get with them and see if we can get you in touch with them so that your public, your listening audience, will be able to hear from those inside what their final word their thoughts for that fateful day. Well, we're out of time. Gary, I want to thank you for being a very good, very special guest once again. I want to thank you for all your investigations and your reporting on the behalf of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, the CAGI News Service in Waco, Texas. 
You've done a wonderful job. I'd like to remind our listeners that the investigations that Gary has done have been excellent. However, we must state that his views and ideas do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas of William Cooper, the Hour of the Time, the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence Network, WRNO, their managers are their owners. Folks, if you never do anything else that I've ever asked you, please remember Waco, Texas. This closing number is dedicated to all those who died, were cremated by the federal government, and those who are in jail pending charges. Good night, and God bless you all.